Jnana-timilandasya Jnana-njana-shalakaya Chakshuranamilitam yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Mukam Puruti Vachadam Pangum Langayati Girim Yad Kripatam Ambande Shri Guru Dinatanam Vansha Kalpaturu Vashtra Kripa Sindhu Yaeva Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Mahavadannaya Krishna Prema Kridayate Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namne Gauratishe Namaha He Krishna Karuna Sindho Dina Bandho Jagatvate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanshara Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishapanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vrindai Tulsi Devi Vyai Priyai Keshavasyacha Krishna Bhakti Prade Devi Sakya Bhattai Panchatatvatmakam Krishnam Bhaktarupa Swarupakam Bhaktavataram Bhaktakyam Namami Bhaktashaktikam Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Next, I'm offering my same unlimited Dandavat Pranams to the lotus feet of my beloved Sikh of your names. Nitya Lila Pravishta Om Vishnu Pai Asto Tarasata Sri Srila Bhakti Vinamita Narayana Goswami Maharaj. And Nitya Lila Pravishta Om Vishnu Pai Asto Tarasata Sri Srila Bhakti Raksha Sri Har Goswami Maharaj. I'm offering my Dandavat Pranams to the Lotus Feet of Almighty Sri Rupa Anika Guru Varada. And my Dandavat Pranams to all the Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis here in this assembly and Sri Jagannath Puri Dham at Chakra Tirtha, holy place, under the guidance of our beloved Guru Dev. My Dandavat Pranams to all. so many days, wonderful uh, nectar kata from Pujapad uh, Bhaktivedanta Tridangi Maharaj, who put together an astonishing presentation, very relishable, of all Sri Krishna's wonderful pastimes, and based upon his form of the demons, which of course is a very particular rasa that Sri Krishna tastes. Yeah. But he doesn't only taste it when he comes personally, you know, in 
his original form. Because Sri Krishna's original form, he is called the Avatari. So that means whatever incarnations um, have ever manifested anywhere yeah, in all the whole cosmic manifestation of this material world or in the spiritual world far beyond this material world, all of them came from one. And that is Sri Krishna. How do we know this? How do we know this fact? Someone may challenge. Why do you think that Krishna is the origin of everything? We think that Lord Narayan, Vishnu, is the origin of everything. There are many people in India also who say like that. Or if you speak of people in the Vedic culture, we will also find so much challenging from people of other faiths, religions, etc. How do you know? We believe in the Bible. We believe in the Quran. We believe this, that, this, that. But, uh, if they want to pose such a question, we will give them a very, very profound and extensive answer. And we will refer them to the most authoritative literatures that exist on this whole planet and in this universe. And these literatures, they are not only uh, telling, but who else is telling? Those who have realized. Those who have actually realized and seen with their own eyes transcendental reality. Without that, no one can enter. And no one can know. How can you know uh, the supreme absolute reality from which everything comes? You can't even know what is beyond your eyelids if your eyes are closed. You have such power of knowing. You have such power of sense perception that one tiny little thin piece of skin comes in front of your eyeball and you see nothing. And yet you want to say, show me God. If there's a God, show me God. People challenge. Right? But we tell them, what qualification do you have to see the supreme transcendental reality? You cannot even go and see the president of your country simply because you want to. You have to become qualified. And when he wants to come and see you, then you can see him. So one tiny little ordinary jiva who for a very short span of life is the president of some tiny little piece of land on one tiny little planet in the vast cosmic manifestation of this universe amongst millions and billions of universes. Huh? And still, even to see such a person, insignificant person, to us as insignificant as an ant, the to the demigods in the heavenly planets, <clears throat> any president, king, this, that of this planet is nothing but an ant. So what to speak of that absolute supreme being? So if he does exist, you better know that you're going to have to have some qualifications to approach him and to see him. But because he wants you to be there, therefore he makes himself available. He makes himself, he manifests himself in innumerable incarnations to show you, yes, I exist. And in those incarnations, he exhibits his transcendental qualities from whom all qualities have come. We all have qualities. Nobody is quality less, are they? If you're a person, you have qualities. If you're impersonal. But there is no impersonal within our. We look at the air, impersonal. We look at the sky, impersonal. But it also has qualities, does it not? It's called guna. Guna means qualities. But 
all qualities come from the source of everything that exists. And those qualities, they are tiny, tiny little atomic particles in comparison with the vast sun. Just like in the sun rays, there are innumerable molecular atomic particles in the sun rays, right? But how, how great is that in comparison with the entire sun planet? So whatever qualities the tiny little jivas can manifest in the conditioned state of material consciousness and material condition is only a tiny, tiny little reflection. This is a very, very important first step in understanding God. Understanding the Supreme Absolute Truth. This is a very essential step to understand that I am nothing but the most tiny little insignificant particle of consciousness. And he is the vast supreme unlimited consciousness. In Sanskrit language, the word is vibhu. Vibhu means he who is unlimited, all expansive. And anu means atomic, atomic, the opposite of vibhu. So for someone to suggest that this tiny little atomic uh, anu chaitanya particle of consciousness can become the supreme consciousness is absurd. But yet, in Kali Yuga, such bogus philosophies become uh, influ uh, people become influenced by them because of ignorance. So we depend upon authoritative knowledge. And that authoritative knowledge is called the Vedas. Now where does the Vedas come from? They come from that absolute source. Otherwise you could never know him. Huh? If he did not want to make himself known to you, you would never ever be able to know about him. So therefore Krishna has a whole system of bringing all the jivas in this material world in whatever bodies that they're inhabiting at the present moment, in any species of life, they're all his eternal atomic particles of consciousness. They belong to him. He has an eternal relationship with every jiva. So he has a plan that gradually every jiva will gradually progress and develop their consciousness, and one day they will approach him. But how? First they'll come in connection with saintly persons, and they acknowledge. That is why Krishna manifests that in this material world. So the Vedas tell about the incarnations of that one supreme absolute truth, who is called Bhagavan. You know the meaning of the word Bhagavan? You know? I like to ask this question a lot because Prabhupada introduced that conception in the very beginning of the Srimad Bhagavatam commentaries that there's a difference between God and the Absolute Truth. There's a big difference between God and the Absolute Truth. Because God means controlling. In Sanskrit it's called Ishwara. Ishwara means controlling. Everyone has some ability to control, isn't it? We're all controllers, but on a very minute scale. But above us, there's always some greater controller. And above that person, there's another greater controller. And in our universe, the greatest controllers, like Lord Shiva, like Brahma, like the, the god of the sun planet, Surya, Vivasvan, they all are not independent controllers. They are not. Some people think this is a diseased understanding of modern day Hinduism. That there's so many gods, so many controllers, so many. You can worship any of them and you go to the one impersonal supreme and you merge. This is the Mayavad philosophy in Kali. Right? Infecting almost every religion. Because if they don't have proper Vedic knowledge, 
That's what they will come to. An erroneous conclusion of the absolute. So the absolute truth means he from whom everything has come. Janmad yasya yataha. Janmadi. Janma means origin or birth. Adi means beginning with. So in Sanskrit language, you have the word Adi used where you want to, in, you want to infer that something uh, like etc, etc. You see? So beginning with. So that absolute truth is the origin of everything. And then as everything is existing, he is the maintainer of everything. And at the end, he winds up that creation and he is the destroyer of everything. Janma Yasya Yataha. He from whom the, the origin, the maintenance, and the destruction of everything has come. So our Guru Dev, when he came to the Western countries, he liked very often to refer, because he's now dealing with the Western conception of God. So he used to break that down into the three letters of the word God. G-O-D. And then he would say, what is the meaning of God? It means G for generator, O for operator, and D for destructor. But the Vedic conception of God is not that. The Vedic conception of God is He from whom everything comes. So that absolute truth from whom everything emanates, you will have to come ultimately to the conception of Bhagavan. And then in the Bhagavan conception, you'll have to come to different levels of Bhagavat Tattva. And ultimately, you'll come to the Narayan conception of Godhead, who is existing within the spiritual reality, who has marital transcendental form with all majesty, opulence, power. Um, that supreme being, when he manifests in that way, then he lives in his kingdom, ruling as a king. You see? And he is tasting so much transcendental pleasures within the realm of this Aishwarya, this opulence. You see? Just like in this world, you have kings. What do they do? They accumulate wealth, they accumulate palaces, they surround themselves with so many material enjoyments, etc., etc., isn't it? If a king doesn't have that, he's not a king, right? And he has so much power, so much control, so much authority, so many followers, that's king. But the tiny little kings of this world can't compare one tiny iota to the supreme, magic, majestic personality of Godhead, who is known as Narayan. And he exists in his realm called Vaikuntha. What is the meaning of Vaikuntha? <clears throat> Vaikuntha means no limit. Unlimited. Everything here in this material world is limited. It's punta. But there, vai punta. Unlimited. If you want to approach that absolute truth, you will have to completely toss away, leave behind all of your material, limited conceptions of reality. Because he's way billions and trillions of times beyond your conception. He's inconceivable. A chintya. You can't think about it with your tiny little brain. Because your brain is made here in the mundane prison house of maya potency. And maya potency means what? Maya. That which is not. Not this. So whatever you think something is in this realm, it's actually not. Yes? We think, oh, I'm a lady, I'm born in Italy, I'm, I'm a man, I'm born in Russia. We think like this. But are we actually? Is this really true that that's what I am? 
Huh? I'm a Texan? Is that true? Why is it not true? Yeah. Because this is only this temporary machine, which you think is you, because of the effect of Maya. But Maya means not this. So that deluding potency of the Supreme Lord, it comes from Him. He has His potency called Maya. But that potency of Maya has its original form also. And we've heard about that so much in such wonderful ways in the last few days called the Krishna's internal spiritual potency which is called Yoga Maya. Huh? So that Yoga Maya is fully for Krishna's enjoyment because he's the supreme enjoyer. So therefore, his energies serve his purpose and his desires. He has one desire. Krishna has one supreme desire above all other desires. What is that? Uh -huh. Quest to enjoy. <laughs> but how? To taste rasa. To taste rasa is Krishna's full 24 hours eternally, his desire is to taste rasa. And why is that? Why is that? Because he is rasa. In the Vedas, there is one nice little statement. I often have the devotees repeat this. It's just three words. Three words. You can memorize this Vedic aphorism. Huh? What is that? Raso vai saha. So, now you all repeat after me. Raso, Raso. vai saha. Raso vai saha. Raso vai saha. So this very authoritative statement within the Vedic literatures, it is telling. Raso vai saha. Saha means he. Vai is rasa. Rasa. He is rasa. So if you want to know that supreme reality and you don't enter into the conception of rasa, you will never understand. You see? Like the lower conceptions of God uh, they are basically referring to the creation of the material universe, the Christian conception of God. So they don't have any conception of God's enjoyment. It's not really mentioned. No conception of his enjoyment. Because they don't have the personal understanding of the Supreme. But in the Vedic conception, it begins with this. Rasa Vaisaha. That he is ecstasy personified. He is made of ecstasy. He exists to enjoy ecstasy. And everything connected with him is for his enjoyment of ecstasy. Because he's ecstasy himself. Yes. And that is called Rasa. So this word is very important for us. Rasa. And the study of rasa is called rasa tattva, the reality of rasa. And when you come into the conception of Bhagavan, then you have to begin to understand rasa, because he is the supreme enjoyer of all rasa. And all others are enjoyed by him. Yes. And that's what Srila Sridhar Maharaj is always used to refer to. Very nice uh, philosophical statement by this German philosopher called Hegel. And uh, he liked Hegel's conceptions. They had some similarity to Vedic conceptions. Huh? And what Hegel told 
was one very nice little aphorism. He said, God is by himself and for himself. Think about that. God is by himself and for himself. How do we understand this? How do you understand that, that statement? God is everything. He perceives everything to be himself. And he is enjoying himself. Good try. Anything more? By himself. God is not an object to be enjoyed by anybody else. From our perspective, we are used to user enjoyment. This approach will be nullified. That's good. Why does it say by himself? He's fully independent. He's fully independent by himself. He's not depending on anyone. Yes. From himself also. Yeah. Everything that is there is within him. Yeah. But he's always with the God by himself. Some aid are great. That before there was anything, there was only him. And he is, as you just said, your soul by son. That's his embodiment. So by himself, so himself. Yes. Atmagamas He's completely happy in himself. He doesn't need anything outside him. Yes. So good. All of you are very good Vedic scholars. And your Vaishnavas who have been practicing, therefore you have Bhagavad Tamaguri Gyanam. So, in the first verse of the Srimad Bhagavatam, it is telling there that he is Avidya, Swarat. This absolute truth from which everything comes is avidya and swarat. He is inconceivable and he is independent. And he knows everything. Fully conscious of everything. And as we heard, he is independent. Because everything depends upon him and he depends upon no one. In the sense of his reality, his tattva, his existence, he depends upon no one. So although he's the supreme independent, but we've been hearing that he's very dependent. Huh? Upon Mother Yashoda, for example. He's even fearful of her. This is a very astonishing thing. The supreme independent reality is dependent upon his mother. Why is that? Why does the supreme independent come under such uh, oppression? <laughs> that he allows himself to be so manipulated and controlled and terrorized even. <laughs> Why? Because he wants to taste it. What does he want to taste? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He is for himself. For himself means that everything that exists is for him. And as, as long as we think that we are independent of him, uh, that we can enjoy separately from him, we will have to suffer in the illusory energy of mind. Because that's not true. No one can be independent and enjoy separately from him. It is an illusion. So as long as someone wants to have that, then they have to be within the domain of the lower material energy. You see? And they have to try which is what is going on in the material world, they have to try to become the enjoyer. I'm the enjoyer. By myself. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Prabhupada used to say, uh, I am the uh, Lord of all that I survey. Yeah, like that. 
I am the master of all that I survey. And that mastership tendency uh, it builds and builds and builds in the material world. Just like we heard about the Kumar and Mani Griva. They're in a very high independent position in the material world. And they think they're independent enjoyers. So this is the problem. This is the root problem. And the root cause of all our suffering. As soon as we give that up, as soon as we give up that illusory conception that <clears throat> I am the enjoyer, and that's called Purush Bhav. Purush means enjoyer. Krishna is the supreme Purusha, Param Purusha. He's the supreme enjoyer. So as soon as we give up this tendency to think I am the enjoyer, and we understand the actual reality that I am to be enjoyed by Him, then we immediately begin to come out of the clutches of the illusory energy. Yes? Wouldn't someone think from your explanation that the Lord has a selfish tendency? Yes. Can you clear that down? Yes. yes. Can you say louder? You can say I was suggesting that someone may consider that because the Lord only conceives of everything for Himself, that saying this to us might make us think that perhaps He has the same horrible tendencies of selfishness that we all possess. Mm -hmm. So I asked Maharaj just to clear that. Right, and He wants to exploit everyone at their cost, right? At their cost. Like yes. That is actually the Christian, the Christian conception. Huh? That God is a jealous God that He can get very easily angered because if you deviate a tiny little bit and you happen to do that in this life, then you have no more further chances. You're condemned to eternal damnation in hell. You suffer forever for a very short period of time that you were ignorant also. So that conception uh, is very frightening. And it's also not a very nice, that's why so many people become atheists or agnostics. Because uh, they don't know the conception of God as the enjoyer of all rasa. Now I'm going to uh, address that because I was actually going to kind of get there because it would seem like that to a conditioned soul that why should he be the enjoyer? Why should I be the loser? I'm the loser. He's the gainer. Uh, this is not a good position. Like a slave in the material world where I have to just always suffer at the hands of a master. It's a horrible position in the material world to be a slave, isn't it? Nobody. If you ask anybody, you want to be a slave? No. No. Everyone wants to be the opposite. They want to avoid slavery at any cost. But basically, everybody is a slave in the material world. They're the slave of what? The three gunas, the three material modes of nature, the material energy of Maya, and they're serving like slaves the dictations of the illusory energy. Enjoy this. Your senses should try to taste this, try to taste that. You are the enjoyer, you are the enjoyer. But it's illusion. Because you can't enjoy. Separately. Here's the example Prabhupada gave. You want to taste something very nice and tasty and nice. You have a tongue. The tongue is meant for that. Tasting very wonderful and vegetable tastes. All of us love because the tongue is the most voracious, right? So the tongue loves to taste all these different tastes. But if you put a, a piece of cloth over your tongue and then you try to taste, that's our condition at the present time. You see? This is, this is what those conditioned souls are trying to do in the material world with a rag over their tongue. And they're trying to enjoy. 
But what always happens as a result of this trying to enjoy, you become entangled. You become entangled more and more in the illusory energy of Maya, in the karmic complexities of Maya, and you suffer. So, there are many verses. You can quote one after the other. Lord Prashanti, in the fifth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, telling him, Nunam pramate kuru de pi karma yad indriya prita ya apranoti milet yata atmano yam asamina pi kreshita asadeha. What's the meaning? This life is really reserved. He's telling his 100 sons, by the way, and Lord Vishavdev is an incarnation of Krishna in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And he's giving them the final instructions before he leaves to take sannyas and renounce the whole world. And many of his sons were in the royal order. He was a king, and they're also going to become kings. So he's giving them the ultimate instructions. Prabhupada would like to quote these very often. So this particular verse, Prabhupada especially quoted this one more than any other. So, Nuna Nkarnata. This tendency of Indriya Pritaya of becoming so greedy just to consummate the world through the senses makes you actually commit horrible, cruel acts mm -hmm. in karma. But then he's really advising Nasaulumani, a person who is a little sober. He is never engaging in activities which are even available mm -hmm. for school mm -hmm. teachers. Yes. Nasarvam nityata atmanuyam asanati kleshada asadeha. What happens as a result of this? You will immensely suffer. Yes. Kleshada. So, just to clarify this a little bit more, very good. Nunam pramatta kurute. Those persons who try to enjoy indriya priti, material sense enjoyment, with their senses in the material world, uh, indriya priti are aprinoti. This is their object, their aim. So, Lord Vrishabhadev says, they are pramatta. Pramatta means crazy. Crazy. One of the first articles I ever read by Srila Prabhupada was in a little book uh, called The Christian Reservoir of Pleasure. And, in, and the article was from his lecture called, Who is Crazy? And Prabhupada was addressing that the mundane materialists, when they look at the devotees, they think, these people are crazy. They're wasting their human life of trying to enjoy sense gratification and all kinds of mundane enjoyments and everything, huh? sinful life, sinful. Hmm? But actually, who is really crazy? Lord Vishapi is telling, these persons are pramatta. They become mad, maddened by the illusory energy. And therefore, they're just simply chasing after mundane sense gratification, thinking this is going to make them happy. But he says, na sadhu manye consider that this is very good for them. Why? Because their atma becomes entangled in this complexity of karma huh? as a result. Huh? And then a son a bee, they're, they're in the asat existence, the mayak existence, a son a bee klesha da asadeha. They are given another material body and suffering connected with the material body as a result of this. So this ain't good. <laughs> it's not good for the soul. So the sadhus in this world, the pure devotees, they see everyone as madly rushing here and there with no knowledge, trying to find happiness here and there. They go to the mountaintop. They throw themselves out of airplanes. They try to swim in the ocean and surf. They try to do everything. But what are they really doing? When Prabhupada saw the people surfing for the first time when he went to Hawaii, he said, what do they call this? 
And they said, oh, Prabhupada, this is called surfing. He said, what? Suffering? <laughs> <laughs> so the pure devotee has no illusion. He sees that the foolish conditioned souls are these poor, tiny, little, ignorant jivas that are separated from Krishna because they try to enjoy separately from Him and therefore they continuously cause their own suffering life after life after life. So He's very merciful. He wants to awaken them and He wants to give them the Vedic knowledge. And what is the Vedic knowledge? What's the message of the Vedas? There's one very nice statement in the Vedas. Utishtata Jagrata this is the message of the Vedas to all the jivas. Oh, Utishtata, get up. Jagrita, wake up from your endless sleep in the illusion of Maya. Pravyavarani Bodhata. Now gain this transcendental knowledge, which is your birthright in the human form of life. That is the message of the Vedas. Come to this knowledge. Come to the lotus feet of Guru. Hear the transcendental knowledge. Change your direction. Come out of the darkness into the light. That is the message of the Vedas. And the sadhus, the Vaishnavas, they are the most merciful manifestations of the Supreme Lord in this world. I'm getting carried away without getting to what I wanted to say about Bhagavan and also what Trinamya Maharaj was telling that this looks like Bhagavan is not very kind and merciful. Yes, I am getting there also. <laughs> but Guru is mixed in with this also. It's coming. <laughs> so, first I want to say that because Krishna is made of rasa, okay, and what is rasa? I already said, rasa is ecstasy, but you can't really use that word ecstasy for the complete definition of rasa. You'll have to study the definition of rasa. You'll have to read the entire literature of Rupa Goswami called Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu to understand what is rasa. <clears throat> but in another way, in a very simple way, Srila Gurudev told rasa uh, is actually love. Love. We can identify because in every language there's a word for love. Amor or Lumpov or love. Like this. And Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur told in one article titled Love. And in Sanskrit it's actually called Priti. Priti. And he says, Oh, whenever we hear these syllables, our heart becomes so charmed. Whenever we hear the word love. And that's why all the poets from the beginning of time and all the minstrels and songsters and songwriters, and they're all talking about this. Why? Because this is what our heart seeks after all the time is love. And, but that love is actually rasa. It is actually Krishna. Because Krishna is love. So we were walking with Gurudev. This, I always tell this pastime when Luda was walking in the Philippines, first time he came there, and on the sidewalk, you know, before the cement is hardened, somebody write, wrote in some words, right? You know, something, and then it hardens and then it's there. Sometimes they write their own name, or such and such love, such and such, you know? So, in this case, Shri Gurudev was walking and he saw that and he stopped and he said, God is love. Somebody had written that. God is love. And they said, yes, God is love. And love is God. And I was wondering, oh, how, how deeply Gurudev must be conceiving of this simple little English statement, which most people like to mouth this, but they have no real understanding. But here is Maha Bhagwat Param Rasik Vaishnava, who's really seeing what does this really mean? God is love and love is God. So Shiva he had a, a lecture that day and it was like a Sunday program 
And through they've actually used that term. And then from then on, he kind of used it now and then. God is love and love is God. Because of, huh? yeah, so many times. You see? Because, as we're saying, Rasa Vai Saha, he is Rasa, that means he is love. Because Rasa means love. And not only that, but his counterpart of his very whole self is called his Swarup Shakti, his very own power, his potency. Huh? And that potency within him takes a separate form for the purpose of exchanging rasa, for the purpose of exchanging love. And that personality is the most beautiful, incredibly attractive, sweet, charming, feminine form that exists in all of existence. And she is made of his love. She is She is Mahabharata So that personality, Shri Radha and Shri Krishna, they are one, but they separate themselves for the purpose of tasting rasa. And whatever Krishna does in the spiritual world, it is a manifestation of his desire to taste rasa because his internal potency, Shrimati Radhika, who manifests the entire yoga maya existence in the spiritual realm, uh, she arranges for him to taste unlimited infinite rasa. Because she's all powerful. All powerful. She's the infinite power. And she knows everything what Krishna desires. So therefore, Krishna just simply desires. I want to taste rust. And then she fulfills that desire by arranging everything. Now, what about here, the material world, where the living entities have to be born and die, and suffer from disease and old age and all the rest? Is this also a realm for him to taste rasa? Yes. Yes. Many rasas. Uh, it takes a while, actually, to even explain this point. But he doesn't limit himself to his superior internal potency. He also comes and takes thrust within the material realm. There are 12 different lessons that you will have to learn if you want to understand him. Uh, because these 12 rasas make up all of the infinite desires that he has to taste all the infinite varieties of rasas. They combine in millions and unlimited ways and he tastes unlimited rasas. So that personality, who is one supreme being, he expands himself into the material world and he manifests pastimes of tasting rasa. Huh? And all of these different forms of his incarnations are fully transcendental. They have nothing to do with the material world. And those manifestations of his tasting rasa are the very medicine for the conditioned soul's disease of wanting to be independent from him because they're so powerful, that sound vibration of his pastimes, his leelas, that when you hear them, it destroys your material existence. That's how powerful his pastimes are, his harikata. So that is his mercy, to come and enjoy within the material world. And he also rescues the conditioned souls he rescues them from this endless cycle of birth and death. Huh? And that pastime of rescuing the conditioned souls is a rasa. It's called karunya rasa. Karunya means compassion, mercy. That's why we have within ourselves this tendency to also be compassionate. If a person is good-hearted, they'll automatically be merciful and compassionate when they see someone in difficulty. If they're demoniac, they don't feel that. Huh? Because they're so far away from Bhagavan. Just like Lord Varaha. Yes. So compassionate to Mother Earth. Yes. And that rasa, in the Gita Govinda, Jaya Govinda says, Vatsalya Ras. for each of the Yes, yes, yes. Right. And if we go further like that, as Chidani Maharaj reminded, all the, he doesn't just taste one rasa, he tastes innumerable rasas, just like in the form of the Bore incarnation, Lord Varaha Dev, whose appearance day is today in the universe, 
Huh? He's the first incarnation. He's the first one to come into the universe. And he took the form of a boar. Why did he take the form of a boar? Huh? There are reasons. <laughs> Very interesting how Gurudev explained. Because the earth planet, this one, it had actually fallen off of its rotation, off of its axis. And it had gone down to the bottom of the universe. It's called the Garvadak Ocean. Huh? And that ocean, it was submerged. So the demigods prayed for the Lord to come. And there were also many other causes in Vaikuntha and all of that. Yes. First they tried to work it out themselves yeah. for a long time. Lord Brahma, how to, and then he couldn't, and then he thought, ah, oh, just let Krishna do it. Uh, and when he said that, then yes. Varaha appeared. But <laughs> yeah. that process went through. It's so it amazing, it's so amazing when you actually study the chapters of the Srimad Bhagavatam, third canto, where the whole story is unfolding, but it begins there in Vaikuntha. Because why? Because the Lord had a desire. What was his desire? He wanted to taste Vira Rasa. Vira Rasa is chivalry, you know? And this is, we see this all in human society, right? that people like to fight, they like to have sports, they like to conquer over, they like to show their, you know, their power. This is called Vira Rasa. It's a genuine Rasa that people want to taste. Why? Because it comes from him. It's inside of him. So he wanted to taste Rasa and he wanted to fight. No, no, it's also. Yeah, but also is described as Vatsalya Ras. No, no, but I'm talking about about the cause. The cause. He was fighting for thousands of years. Yeah, I know. I know. But but the cause is that in Vaikuntha he had this desire to taste Rasa. Now, will his desire go unfulfilled? I ask you that question. I learned it by Shabbos. Will any of Krishna's desires go unfulfilled? No. Impossible. <laughs> so, Yoga Maya, Yoga Maya, who arranges to fulfill his desires, she inspired in the heart of two of his gatekeeper servants in Vaikuntha, Jai and Vijay, that they could detect in their Lord that, oh, our Lord has a desire to fight. Oh, we want to fulfill his desire because that's the nature of the eternal devotees to fulfill his desire. We want to fulfill his desire and fight with him. We can fight with him. Just like Krishna fights with his coward boys and so forth. But he said, actually, we cannot really fight with him because in order to fight with somebody, they have to be very opposed, you know? They have, there has to be opposition, almost like hatred. Then you can really have a fight, you know? <laughs> So, they thought inside of themselves, oh, if only we could fulfill his desire. That was implanted in them by Yoga Maya. And then Yoga Maya also arranged for four Kumaras to come there within the material universe, the Vaikuntha region, and come and try to see Lord Narayan, and the gatekeepers were inspired to stop them. And when they were stopped, even though they're Brahmanas and they're very peaceful, but Yoga Maya inspired them, who are you stopping us? You know, how dare you stop us? You are not, you deserve to be here in Vaikuntha. We curse you. And they curse them that they should fall to the material world and become demons, you see? And suddenly Lord Narayan came there because he knows everything and to save his devotees. And then a pastime unfolded that now they accept this curse. And they go down to the material world for three lifetimes, three. And they take birth as demons. They actually had a choice. They could go for seven lifetimes as devotees. Huh? Or they could three lifetimes as demons. Oh, they chose three lifetimes because they wanted to return to their Lord more quickly. But actually, they also were inspired because without them becoming demons, the Lord can't unfold his pastimes, you see? So they manifested in the material world Jaya Vijay has three different births as demons. And the first birth was this person named Hiranyaksha, who Lord Varahadev, the born incarnation, came to fight with. And, this, and the, uh, his brother was named Hiranyakashipu, who Lord Nishringadev came to fight with and destroy him, and tasted unlimited rasa. Now, if, when, if and when the time comes, 
that we could actually read the description. Sometimes when I'm in certain places, I actually read that whole chapter of their fight, their battle. Because it's so amazing. The Lord, how He's tasting this rasa, and how He's playing with the demon, you know? And uh, so in this way, by killing the demon, Krishna tasted rasa, but also what did He do? He also manifested the pastime that if the conditioned souls hear this in the material world, they'll become liberated. They'll become His devotees. That's the power of all of His pastimes. So Lord Varahadev, you know, He rescued, He took the form of a boar. Now Krishna can take any form, can He not? Can He take any form of His desire? Can He become a caterpillar? Can He become a mosquito? And guess what? He does. Because Prabhupada writes this in one of the purports of the first, uh, first or second chapter, third chapter, yeah, the, the schedule incarnations, right? And then he says there that actually the Lord descends in as many species of life as there are. And then he says, of course this is inconceivable to the human brain. But he actually takes every single form of every single species of life and manifests an incarnation. Because there are unlimited incarnations, as unlimited as the waves of the ocean. He's manifesting these incarnations in the material world. So he took this Varaha form because the earth has fragrance. The Bhumi has fragrance. And a boar has a very how do you say, exaggerated or highly developed sense of smell, right? Their snout and their sense of smell. So he took this form to locate the Earth planet, which was submerged in the Garbadak Ocean. And Gurudev, I remember in Malaysia, when he told this on Varaha's appearance day one time, he made like a shape, like a form of how Varaha Dev dove into the ocean uh, with his hooves. But this Varaha form was very beautiful. We usually don't think of a boar as being very beautiful, although there are some people that actually like to have pigs as their pets. And so, but he was very beautiful, golden color. Any of the incarnations of the Lord are extremely beautiful, no matter what form they take. Uh -huh. Yes, she got what? The hair, that golden hair. Yes. On his chest. Yes, on his chest. He's decorated with Sri Matsa. So, then he found the, the earth planet. And then, because the boar has tusks, that's another reason why he became a boar, he lifted up the earth planet on his tusks and brought it out. And when he appeared on the Karbadak Ocean, this demon from a distance, he saw who is this incredible form? Because this demon was very huge. And you, know, you can imagine how huge is Lord Varahadev. But he actually manifested from the nostril of Lord Brahma. Uh, and he was very tiny. And then he hovered in the sky and he expanded and expanded and expanded. And then they knew, whoa, he's Vishnu. He has come to execute his pastimes. So, um, so when the demon saw him from a distance, he was astonished. Who is this? What manner of beast is this? You know, and he was actually terrorizing the entire universe with his club and going here and there and smashing mountains and saying, who can challenge me? So, you see, this is an opponent. And now he showed his opposition. And now he threatened. Who is this man, this weird, strange creature? And Lord Varahadev looked so... so an amphibious beast. Yeah, an amphibious beast. What is this? And then Lord Varahadev, he, he stood there glowing and effulgent with the earth planet. And then he saw the demon, and then he placed the earth planet by his power. He placed it in its position. And then he turned toward the demon. And then the battle began. So Lord Krishna, when he comes in all these forms, He's tasting all varieties of rasas. And later on, when he had conquered the demon and destroyed him completely, all the demigods came and they offered prayers to him. And they, they told him, Oh Lord, you are the personification of all Vedic yagyas. That is your transcendental form. 
So that Varaha Dev, we will go to Navadweep in some days and the temple in Navadweep. Okay? This is a very amazing thing. That in that part of the nine islands of Navadweep, it is called Kola Dweep. Kola means and Lord Varaha Dev appeared there millions of years ago. And he also knew that this is the Holy Dham in which he will appear in the future as Lord Gauranga, the most merciful incarnation. So that island is named after him and our Acharyas, uh, like Srila Bhakti Pragyana Kesha Maharaj and our Gurudev, in there on the altar in Koladweep, they established a deity form of Lord Varaha Dev. Uh, so that Varaha Dev form is very, very powerful and merciful to purify our hearts. He's the personification of all Vedic Yajyas. And on this day, it is his appearance day. And it begins the manifestation of Krishna's unfolding of his unlimited incarnations and pastimes in the universe. So Jayadeva Goswami, he told, Keshava Drita, Shukara Rupa. Shukara also means war. Jaya Jagadisha Hare, Jaya Jagadisha Hare, Jaya Jagadisha Hare. All victory, all glories to Jagadisha, the master and lord and controller of the whole universe, who is none other than Hari himself, Jaya Jagadisha Hare, who takes all these forms. Keshava Drita. Uh, actually, he's Keshava, he's the Supreme Lord Krishna, but now. Drika, he has taken this form, Shukara Rupa, this form of a boar. And Keshava Drita Narahari Rupa takes the form of half man, half lion. Keshava Drita Minasarira takes the form of a fish incarnation. All these incarnations are there in Srimad Bhagavatam, and they're only a tiny, tiny little section of his unlimited spiritual forms that he manifests within the material world in all the different species of life. So, we talked a little bit about Lord Varaha Dev, <laughs> and we talked about Krishna's desire to taste rasa, but I want to say that Krishna is very, very merciful. And because He's the Supreme Merciful, whoever serves Him with love, they taste so much ecstasy, even though they don't want. It's not that they're going to Him. I want to enjoy ecstasy. No. They have no intention. But it is His nature. Uh -huh. All the eternal living entities in Vaikuntha, in Goloka, in everywhere, throughout all the whole creation, they're all tasting ecstatic love from Him because He is the one center point of everyone's devotion and love. He is the center point. Srila Sridhar Maharaj used to say, uh, just like when you have a circle, uh, and you have a uh, point in the middle of the circle, okay? So then there's a circumference drawn around that point. But in Krishna's existence, he says, hmm, there is no circumference, only the center is there everywhere. Krishna is everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. That center point is everywhere, all center, no circumference. And those pure devotees like Prahlad Maharaj, the son of the demon Hiranyakashipu, who will get killed the next one by Lord uh, Nishringadev. So Hiranyakashipu uh, is trying to kill his son, Prahlad, a pure devotee. But then his, the demon father said, so you think you are so powerful? Where does your power come from? He said, my dear father, my power comes from the same place where you get your power from, from that supreme world. He said, okay, where is your Supreme Lord? He said, he's everywhere. He's everywhere. He said, and he approached a pillar. And he said, oh, is he on this pillar? And Prahlad looked and he said, and he saw him. Lord Jashir, and he saw the eyes of his Lord. Yes, he's there. Then I will destroy him immediately. And then he, very powerful. He was so powerful. He could, con he could control the whole universe with his power. He could conquer over all the demigods. And now he was going to destroy this pillar where his, where the, 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 the source of all power that he thought he was independent of. Well, his son told him, yes, he is there. But as soon as he destroyed this pillar, 
And then what happened? From the pillar came this incredible form, this incredible effulgent form, never been seen before. Half man, half lion. There's all kinds of reasons why. I'm not going to tell the whole Shringa Day last time, although I'd very much like to. <laughs> but, and he was, his appearance in the Bhagavatam, I remember once we were in Malaysia, Nini Maharaj and myself, and we were observing this. Okay, just finishing this right now. And we were there, and, and it described his appearance, Lord Shringa appearance. And Nini Maharaj said, oh my God. It's like, it's like the description of a nuclear explosion, you know, going up into the heavens. Into the, and so we can just imagine when the Supreme Powerful wants to exhibit his power huh, and taste that rasa, he does it very, very nicely. So we're very fortunate that he is so merciful because he's inviting everyone, all conditioned souls, to come and enjoy eternal transcendental happiness with him in the spiritual world. But in order to do that, we'll have to give up this temporary material world, leave it far behind, as Shri Shri used to always say, you will have to die to live. You will have to die to the whole mundane material conception fully, on every level, in order to live in the transcendental world.